all been crushed by the Black Friday shopping rush, mostly because we haven't got Black Friday in the UK. This is episode 23 of the Tux Radar podcast. I'm Paul Hudson. I'm Mike Saunders. I'm Andrew Gregory. And I'm Graham Morrison. And in this episode, we are talking about Chrome has finally made to beta and Linux on netbooks is roaring ahead. Is Linux documentation flat out rubbish? And Chrome OS from Google, do they have the right idea? Don't forget, we're also publishing news, features, and more on tuxradar.com, so bookmark it today. And you can subscribe at tinyurl.com slash podcast LXF. Although this time, as a side point, our new magazine goes on sale tomorrow. It's got an incredible double-sided DVD, hasn't that right, Mike? It has, yeah, with Ubuntu and Mandriva and OpenSUSE. It's quite literally the best silver round thing ever created. Yes, and it's got a free Ubuntu wall chart. Not that we're biased at all. Check it out at the shops tomorrow. The top item in the news today, whether you're a web geek or otherwise, is that Chrome, the beta browser, is out. That's right, it's no longer an alpha browser, it's now a beta browser. So <laughs> the, the difference is a few letters. Uh, there's a Chrome, there's a, a Google product in beta, you say? Yes. yes. <laughs> Unlike so many of their well, other products. Well, at least it's not alpha anymore, that's the main that's thing. That's true, yeah. They're, they're at least saying people should try it now. Yes. That's so, a big difference. So, which, well, what does this correlate to in terms of the Windows version of Chrome? Is it version oh, 4, yeah, 3? Yeah, well, that's the thing. The Linux and Mac OS X version have been rolling, haven't they? They've always been updating to the latest version, but whatever it is. Right, so, right. So, yeah, it's 4.0.25, something like that, I forget. Right, that's cool. Oh. Yeah, so it's the latest version. Always is the latest version. So, do we get plug-in compatibility and things like that? Well, I think Google's working on that. I think, so far, people haven't managed to get many Google plugins to work. Although, I can't tell. I think some of them are jokes. <laughs> if you install the, because you know there was a Chrome patch for IE that put Chrome inside. Yes, IE. yeah. Someone's yeah. made IE that goes inside Chrome, and it, it just crashes Chrome. <laughs> I, 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 it's a joke. I'm not sure. It, what does this crash? Um, so I, I'm not sure. We'll, we'll find out. I guess over time. Yeah, yeah. But you're an avid Chrome fan, aren't you? I I have switched to it as my default browser. Yeah, I, it's weird because the difference. Is normally imperceptible. It's slightly quicker on everything, but that's slightly quicker. It just gets to you after a while. And when I open up Firefox, I can almost load Chrome and loads of, load a of, uh, you know whatever I'm trying to load into that browser window before Firefox has even thought about it. So, yeah, I just do it simply because it's quicker. Yeah. Also, I, I, what I like about Chrome is I don't, I don't get that silly error message saying something like Firefox is already running. <laughs> no, it isn't. Where is it? <laughs> you know, it's, it makes you start a new session or some crap like that because it's got some weird. Browser yeah, lock yeah. and the lock file. I like it. I, I like its. I like its UI. I like the tab browsing, and it makes good use of the screen, especially on a netbook. Are you going to switch, Mike? I am one of the few people who hasn't actually spent much time with Chrome yet, but I think <laughs> this is now the time that I will. I'll well, actually what, investigate. What because it's beta? That was too scary for you. Wasn't oh it? yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I couldn't bear for my web browser. So you're going to drop links then? <laughs> fine, <laughs> fine, 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 fine. I'm going to stop using a, a telnet yeah to, uh, to access websites. Um, it's you know Firefox has been so has been fine for me. It's been good. It's been fast as of version three, so I haven't felt any pressing need yet to change. But I will. I will you, give it a you'll go. You'll see a big difference. The thing is, once you've tried it, you'll never go back. Well, it, <laughs> yeah, it's just it's the same reason why we jumped to Firefox. It's not particularly because it, it's not because it's Google. It's not mm. because it's Chrome. Wait, it's I, I jumped to Firefox because Netscape was crap. <laughs> That's not making me jump to Chrome anymore. Well, well, I I jumped because it was just so slow and crafty and. Big and large and just didn't cumbersome. work. Well, crashy. <laughs> yeah, I don't remember having stability problems. I was just, at the time, I was glad for having a browser on Linux that loaded most websites because for ages that wasn't so. How's the stability with the latest version of Chrome? I don't think I've had any problems with it. I mean, but Graham has quite a low threshold here. He does <laughs> seem to install the latest stuff. I mean, he's running Alpha Chrome since day one, from what I can tell. Yeah. Yeah, I got I got used to running Chrome, and so uh, I have been well, using the PPA. It's Wait, all no, what, didn't you say there was something special that you use for when Chrome crashes, like your your little uptime graph or something like that? So you can tell how your CPU is being thrashed by Chrome. So you can oh yeah, yeah, that that is true. Actually, the, I tell you what, I tell you what's caused <laughs> so all those problems. Out, you see. <laughs> yeah. No, you're absolutely right. Google um, Chrome sometimes becomes a real resource hog, um, and especially with Google Wave, because I found Google Wave hideously bloated and fat and take, takes a massive amount of my CPU power. Is that is that Chrome's problem or is that the same in Firefox? I find Firefox slow with Wave 2. Yeah, but may, yeah, maybe. I mean, you'd think Chrome would do it better. But yeah, I've actually managed to create Waves that in Google Wave that crash Wave. And there's no going back to those Waves. They're totally broken. So oh, they, really? they, they, kind of, they live there. Well, redundant. Make them public. 
Just like yeah, 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 denial yeah. of snowstorm. Yeah, yeah that's it. That's it. <laughs> They come, I mean, at one point, I had an infinite number of waves from this one wave that were kept reproducing. And so, wow. so, it's taking over the world. Yeah. Google Wave's a whole different subject. Yes. Although, yeah, moving on, it, it seems that because uh, Chrome forms the basis of Chrome OS, there is quite a nice hard deadline now on Chrome. Because Chrome OS have said sometime next year. Yeah, yeah. Next year, or this time next year, I expect Chrome OS to be finalized. You have to try and get a final version of Chrome, presumably. So everyone will start testing it and bug fix it before the final version of Chrome OS comes out. Yeah, yeah. Moving on, um, Linux market share in netbooks apparently says one source is now up to thirty-two percent, which is quite different to what you said, Mike. <laughs> it's not different to what I said, but it's different to uh, what a Microsoft what said. Microsoft said, which is not me. Um, yes, <laughs> no, it's not you. <laughs> no, um, despite what some of our listeners may think. It's quite the similar similar names, I've just realised. <laughs> Mike, Mike <laughs> Microsoft, yeah. Um, Yes, I mean, this This is a, a really, really promising figure. Um, no doubt some of these people who buy these netbooks will just go and put a hooky version of Windows onto it. Mm. That's going to happen anyway. But Or a legitimate version. <laughs> or, or indeed, they would go out and buy it. Uh, yeah, or a legitimate version of OS X. Um, but <laughs> it did... It, not anymore. <laughs> not, yeah, not enough if you've got an Atom CPU. Um but, you know, in a way we should expect this. When Dell is pushing Linux, and actually pushing Linux on its netbooks, not just selling them in some random corners, you know, like they used to put free DOS on machines to say they were shipping with an operating system, um, you know, we, we we can expect these numbers and long may it continue. So 32% up from, what was it, a month ago? Well, there, Microsoft... Let's, let's have some idea of, yeah, of, a, of, a, of a curve on a graph. The thing, is, the thing is, no one actually agrees on the numbers. That's a problem. MS mm. were claiming something like 96% were Windows. So this is like a sort of Schrodinger statistic. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> Brilliant. Haven't Dell said it's something like 30% of their sales are Linux? On... I remember MSI saying something very similar. I mean, right. that's, that's something we can trust, isn't it? They have no reason to say otherwise. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, you know, these numbers can be used as bargaining um, chips with Microsoft to say, oh, look, people are loving Linux. You better sell this Windows for even cheaper so that we can, you know, make the Windows versions of our netbooks just as cheap as the uh, Linux ones. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, numbers, psh, numbers, but, um, you know, it's a rough indication. If, if anywhere around a third of, of the netbook, you know, the netbook market is growing and growing and growing. Mm. It looks like it's not going to stop. You know, people thought it might be a fad, but it, 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 netbooks are here to stay. Um, so, you know... Even 20% would be great. One in five machines running Linux. The question is, what distro do you think they're running? Um, Slackware. Slackware, okay. That's one of Slackware. Well, if it's Dell, <laughs> it's got to be UNR, I guess. Yeah, they, well, it's, it's, not, it's, it's UNR customised, isn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. Monkey does. I, I think it's great. I, I, I'm not sure how popular UNR is, because for a while, you know, the Aspire ones had their version and the E's had their version. Yeah. That's that still happening. They still have running with their own version of dodgy Limpus Ross or Limpus or you name it so. I don't know um, I, I hope not that's not to say you know oh I just want to back one distribution but it's nice to have some sort of standardization so people can easily swap apps yeah to, you know across their network it's also nice to have a distribution on there that isn't rubbish <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's the other side of it well there is actually a Dell page you can get to which is like do you want Windows or Ubuntu and they recommend Windows for everyone who's the first time using a computer I'm saying Ubuntu would be better as a first time user because that too, means you haven't too. got any background in Windows. You don't Correct. care. Exactly. No, you don't care. And, and it's, remember, it's a customized version of Ubuntu, so it's got all the easy clicky buttons yeah, and stuff. There's I'm no confusion. Crazy. Um, whereas Windows, you'll get malware in five minutes flat. Well, you know, not not because of Windows being bad, but just because then the users they'll click on everything. Yeah, yeah. If they actually are. If the, yeah. Do those people actually exist? <laughs> first time using computers. Um, well, they'll reckon so. And for our last news story, uh, Graham Special. Uh, Qt Qt 4.6 has been released with support for animation, drop shadows, and blur gestures and multi-touch, which I presume means that uh, KDE 5 <laughs> <laughs> is going to include some awesome new features, and it could be the first without multi-touch in, in 2020. 2020 sounds about right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it but looks... wait, that, that 2020, of course, will be only for developers. It'd be <laughs> <laughs> 2030 for everyone else. It, it looks like a really strong Qt uh, release. I've not tried it, but... Um, I mean, Qt Creators uh, version 1.3 in this, yeah. and uh, that's really going from strength to strength. It's got some pre preliminary refactoring functionality in there, which I think is great because there isn't a decent um, C++ ID with uh, refactoring on, uh, especially on a Qt or KD desktop. Um, and there's, there's a uh, Nokia S60 Symbian emulator in there as well. I mean, it's 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 not. Uh, 
mission critical ready yet, but uh, that's pretty neat. You can develop uh, S60 apps within Creator and run them on the emulator and deploy them to your Nokia phone. Um, that's probably going to become increasingly important uh, because they're moving towards MIMO 5 and QT is being ported to MIMO 5. Yeah, well, you've been to the um, QT conference a few times, haven't you? Yeah, I have. As you said, buzz is growing. Um, the, well, the, the big buzz hasn't actually made it into 4.6. I'm surprised because I think I've talked about it before. The, the thing I was most impressed with was QML, which was this descriptive language for creating graphical widgets and the kind of iPhone widgets you get. Um, and that's been pushed back to 4.7. So there isn't even any... I think all the animation stuff, all the, the morphing and the transitions and the drop shadows that are in 4.6 are probably in preparation for QML proper when 4.7 comes out. Right. And I remember 4.0 being a big change. Yeah, yeah. A huge version change. Obviously, 5.0 is hovering around somewhere. Well, no, actually, I, I, I spoke to, uh, to the Nokia guys and I asked them that question exactly, and nothing, they promised me nothing has been finalized, nothing is in preparation for 5.0. They know it's coming, they know that it's, but, but no, they haven't got any feature plans. Wow. They're, all their focus is still on the, the, the 4 revision because so much is happening and, and there is a lot happening there is a lot happening yeah. so I think I think they're right get get this nailed first get it on whatever platforms they're trying to concentrate on make the API make eight stable and functional um, and then worry about five when they've got a clearer idea of where they're going and I yeah. think I think that's what they're doing one of the interesting features I thought was the um, animation which seems quite directed to clutter yeah yeah and I think we've got an interesting impasse now in the next world again finally two toolkits do the same advanced technology which one's going to be taken and yeah, it is interesting. Uh, the QML is the difference. Um, because I know you said that after writing your recent uh, clutter tutorial that it was relatively complicated to get to get going, to get simple transitions and things working. Now, QML potentially makes things really easy. It, it just works on a very simple tree model. So you define a rectangle, you define the size of the rectangle. QML handles the transitions and also handles the interaction. You don't actually need to be a programmer. It's very much like JavaScript. Um, and that sounds to me what Clutter needs as well, some kind of easy way to access all of those neat features, neat transitions and uh, overlays. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. That sounds great. When, when's, when's it coming out for That's, micOS? It always sounds great, but I start, I start to use it. <laughs> I, think for, I think Qt's brilliant. I think it's got its problems. Um, but it's going... It's You know, this time last year or 18 months ago, we were worried about the Nokia transition, whether... QT will just be kind of erased. I, I need to see QT5 ditching all the macros, <laughs> you know, um, radical restructuring so I can think, I can see how that works from a distance. No, you'll never, you'll never know. I mean, obviously you can see it all, see how it works, but they'll never get rid of things like the signals and slots, which, you know, is so heavily reliant on macros and their weird formatting and yeah. header files. I think they'll stick with that. It's hot. It's the topic. It's the hot topic. Is Linux documentation rubbish? Yeah. Or is it great? Right. Oh, sorry. Oh, well, <laughs> let's you know. Let's just let's just uh, take it easy for a second. Discovery of the week. Then. <laughs> <laughs> this uh, this follows on from um, a discussion on Slashdot uh, the other day, where it, it was pointing to some random blogs around the internet. But the 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 discussion was. Is Linux documentation too much geared towards us super technical users and not enough towards newcomers? So you know, you're including Andrew in the super technical users group. Um, <laughs> that, that, that noise says it all. Um, you know, manual pages, GNU info pages. Mm, are, they, are they up to scratch? Are Awful, they? Are they? Dreadful. Well, should should we have to use man pages? Well, mon monkey users such as myself should never need to look at documentation. We should just, we just need a big button that says you know faster or slower <laughs> turbo button <laughs> exactly, yeah. exactly. <laughs> do stuff button who, who reads the docs for firefox before they you know browse to the daily mail but who actually pressed the turbo button i never got that <laughs> who said i don't want a 33 megahertz CPU. i want an 8 megahertz CPU. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <Alex. laughs> yeah yeah who did that I would presume it was for people running really old games, you know, the original <laughs> speeds. So. Cheating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, slowing down. Um, I mean, I was looking at um, the manual page for CPIO. Oh, that simple beginner's command. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh. CPIO is a, is a really annoying tool to use anyway because it doesn't work like zip or tar or anything else. It's used for what, initRD images? In, initRD images. Um, I think RPM packages are actually CPIO inside. And, and so are dot debs and um, are they are packages anyway? Um, you, you look at the you look at the manual page, and all it is is a big list of flags. 
And then it says at the bottom, read the info page. Now, because I come across a CPIO package like once in the blue moon, I, I never remember the command to extract it or to put it all back together. Yeah, I know you've yeah, got to pipe yeah. it around. So I just want the example. And a good man page, you, you type man through, look, read past all the gump and all the rubbish, and at the end there'll be examples to do the most obvious stuff. But I can't do this with CPIO, so I end up having to use Google. And the other side to this is, it mentioned on Slash, is, is Google becoming documentation then? The examples are the most useful bit of any man page, mm. aren't they? You've, yeah. you've got to scroll through loads and loads of, of useless nonsense yeah. before you get anything worth reading. I, I think if it wasn't for the state of Linux documentation, all four of us here wouldn't have the flaky careers that we're <laughs> rock hanging on to. Because I, I think we make a living out of actually making Linux documentation easier to digest and easier to use. But to be fair, manual pages, they're, they're, they're reference pages, aren't they? They're not designed to teach you. Yeah. You have to learn CPIO, do you? Type well, man. Also, they come back from a time when, yeah, system administrators would be using some of that CPIO and not normal users. I think, I think it's terrible for most people. I mean, even just looking at install Fedora or Ubuntu, there's never really any help getting started or what you have to do from, from the desktop. You know, there's no real user level documentation that can help everyone. I think that really ticks me off. Um, is when it does say, this is the man page, go and read the info page. <laughs> mm. Because you know how sometimes you're in Vim and you're typing away and you, you press some stupid key combination and it starts saying recording mode. And oh, so, yeah, no, yeah, escape, yeah. Escape, escape, yeah. No, let me out, let me out. They won't let you out. You have to press magic key combination to get out of there. And it, you, you find it really hard to escape. It's annoying. I find the same problem in info. I'm a bit of a, a, bit of a thicky. <laughs> I don't quite get how to use info very well. It's like we have the internet now, guys. We have web pages. Just make HTML pages because I can use HTML pages in anything I want to. But if there's, there might be a way, in fairness, in info that you can um, lump everything to one big page because that's what I always want. I hate going through all these, these little submenus yeah. in info. It's just yeah, like, give me a big yeah. page and I'll search. I'll hit slash and search for what I want to do. Um, but yeah, info is... Uh, I why, think why are they so political about it? Why do they, why do they stick it in the man page as well? Well, at, the, at one point, the GCC um, information was only available in info. Do you remember? You'd, you'd look at the GCC man page and it'd yeah. say, oh, no, this is out of date, you better use yeah. info. But due to a massive backlash, eventually, they made some systems so that they're both automatically generated. But I think it's because it was a, a GNU thing. And, uh, yeah, they're and, political about it for some reason. Yeah. I think this is a problem with uh, documentation and geeks in general. I think... Um, programmers, the people who add all the features, don't generally like documentation. They don't like wasting their time doing it. And so there's there's a there's a chasm between the people that write the documentation and people who actually do add the technical aspects of the operating system. And and no one's ever really addressed it. You know, this is what technical writers supposedly do. So the Free Software Foundation, rather than I mean, once now once the um, the SCO legal battle has, has gone away, they really want to hire say for technical writers to write loads of documentation and live in New York for, I don't know. Yeah, that sounds yeah. all right. Yeah. New York? They wouldn't have to pay would much. Would New York do? I'd work for Smarties. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I think that's what, there needs to be some kind of initiative. I, I do like um, the Debian system where every binary has to have an associated man page. Now, a lot of the time it doesn't work and you get, you know, undocumented. But their system, the same, anything you type in, it's but supposed the to, by policy, have a manual page, so at least you can find out what it does. I think the fact that we're talking about info and man pages is pretty desperate. You know, in in the world of in in the age of the World Wide Web, I think you're right. Most people will just Google whatever it is they're trying to do. Mm. But the, the, the thing is, it, the, the whole man page actually, actually puts me off wanting to write documentation. When I I, I put mm. together the gloss framework for Python for making games, the, there's a huge documentation page for it all in HTML. Every single function is documented with examples. Every yeah. single one's got an example. Every one. <laughs> Uh, to do that in man, I have to use trough. Oh, <laughs> no. well, I'm never going to use that. I'm slash gonna... slash dot one. <laughs> exactly. yeah. It doesn't make any sense. I'd, I'd rather use HTML like the rest of the world's using nowadays. I yeah. think you can try and catch up a little bit. And, and you know, when I see man pages where a lot of work has gone in, like the GCC one, mm. I mean, it's been automated perhaps, but it, there, there are so many, many, many options on the GCC man page. You can't find anything because every single one's documented. It's a reference guide. It has to at least mention what they do. It's a reference guide as opposed to a tutorial. And that, that's just not working. Any, any examples? And, and there aren't any. Well, there very rarely are any. And that's all we're really interested in, 70% of the time. Yeah, man, Man-K works, isn't it? So you can do Man-K something like some task. And it'll say, hey, you mean these commands, don't you? So that's a, that's a step forward, but... Uh, so yes. what what about documentation on the desktop then? Aside from command lines, you know, I, I just thinking it through. I think we should it should all be the same. You know, 
man info that we should find that there should be a way of accessing it from the desktop whatever the technical level of it is it should be a single source you used to be able to do that in conqueror couldn't you or kd's yeah. help system it could display info and man and, yeah and it still, things, still can yeah, yeah. It, yeah but you just type in man colon slash slash and then the name of the command right and, and it's it, formatted it will format in, it yeah. into a nicer yeah um but yeah there seems to, there needs to be something more whole you know a, a a portal to all documentation that's searchable and cross-linked and cross-referenced and formatted nicely. A bit um, like our answers archive. <laughs> <laughs> you know, well, yeah. you can at least do do man f printf or something like that. They'll tell you all the commands that printf will take, or parameters and stuff. So you can do well for standard stuff. standard library you stuff. Can, yeah, and that's that. That I've got to admit is very nice. Mm. Work anywhere, so you don't have to do some fancy ID to do coding. You can just do it from the command line. Well, in in, uh, in FreeBSD, you can actually do man and then followed by a driver name, a module, and it'll tell you all the options. You can splice that module. So, you know, it's, it's really broad in FreeBSD. Who's Spec- paid to do the documentation anyway? I mean, maybe that's the problem. I mean, norm- normally with a company like Sun, you know, you, you have a certain number of developers working on a project, and you will have to have a certain number of technical writers that work alongside those developers, you know, mm-hmm. five or ten percent of the, the, the number, you know, and that we definitely haven't got that in Linux development. You know, there's, there's, there's no impetus, there's no reason to add it because people are really just chasing after features. I can't understand. I mean, you know, just from my viewpoint, why anybody would want to write a load of code and then you say, oh, I can't be bothered even writing a manual page for it because, you know, to me that's part of the development process. In, yeah. in writing my OS, I really wanted to put, really have good documentation because otherwise the code would just be a load that's of part assembly. Of reason, They're scratching the ridge, aren't they? Yeah. They've written some code to do something they want to do. It works for them. Mm. Right, but then perhaps we shouldn't accept it into a yeah, you know big know, distro it, assembly. We, should, we, should, we should just, should, shouldn't have that feature then, should we? No, well, we, should, we, should, we should wait for somebody to implement it and document it, so yeah. it, it's implemented fully rather than just. Mm. Yeah, well, I would cut out most of the system. I think. Well, I know, I know what you mean. I, I do. Well, it it would have first, but then when people realised that they weren't getting the props for developing their stuff, then they would have to do it, and they would. Maybe. Well, but it solved their problem. They don't care anymore. Yeah, I never documented mine at all. Never. Yeah. T- Gave any of the features away. You're the problem. Guess. No, not, not even any comments in the code, like, this routine does no, something. No, <laughs> what was no I but often here? I wouldn't <laughs> give any comments at all on the code, because initially it was just for me, or didn't really intend to share it. Yeah. Actually, I'd never thought of that. Maybe I can ask you listeners. I, <laughs> I write all the gloss documentation by hand, by just going through, seeing what I've changed, and adding lots of HTML for it. I'd really like, if you know of one, a nice auto-documenter for, like, Python, so I can add specially marked comments in my Python code, and it will generate the HTML documentation automatically. If you know of one, let me know. I'm sure there is one, but I don't know. I'm sure it exists. Like, like Java doc, except um, yeah. PyDoc. In fact, I bet PyDoc exists, doesn't it? <laughs> <It's called> <laughs> <laughs> if you know of PyDoc, please send Paul a link <laughs> using the internet. Let me Google that for you. So, yes, it's rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> And with yet another mention of Google, we come to the halfway point of our podcast. Still to come, the discovery of the Fortnite and our open ballot is Chrome OS Zero or Hero. So, it's time for the discovery of the week slash Fortnite slash festive period. I hope you're all having a, a lovely time out there in the, in the crispy, fresh, cool air. Unless you're in Australia, maybe, where it's probably quite hot. Mike, what have you been up to these past two weeks? Oh, I, I went to foreign land for a bit. Oh, um, so your discovery is, is what, foreign? Well, my discovery is that ice hockey is ace, especially when you're watching it in a former Soviet bloc country. But um, I also discovered a, a computer program. <laughs> you know, it's, it's something that <laughs> I do. Who wants to know about that? I know. Um, actually, this is called Gnome Paint, so you, we can all infer what that does. <laughs> <laughs> Imme- <Hang on. laughs> immediately from the name. Back to the ice hockey. <laughs> yeah. Um, Gnome Paint is... MS Paint, but remade in GTK. MS Paint is dreadful. I don't see why anyone ever mentioned it. Maybe it's it. a new one. There's um, a new one in Windows 7. No, it's not based on the Windows 7 one, but this... <laughs> Based on the crappy old Windows 95 one. This, this isn't something I'd normally pay much attention to, but with the um, upcoming removal of GIMP from the next version of Ubuntu, as we were talking in the last podcast, there needs to be some sort of drawing no, tool. I think there needs to be some sort of drawing no, tool. If you want to draw a diagram... If you want to draw a diagram, I'll draw a map and send it to somebody. Then you don't want to do that in F spot. So oh, I, think I agree with Mike. I think you need some yeah. some sort of drawing Install program it through a package manager. Install Tux Paint. Could do it, kids. But I think you know, having a, a, a two hundred kilobyte program <laughs> accessory, no, like no, no, well, install a calculator and a text editor through the through, yeah, through yeah. synaptic. So then. We install- <laughs> 
That really gives people the right impression of what Linux is capable of. The, our own version of MS Paint. Graham looks really annoyed at this point. <laughs> <laughs> if you could see this, listeners, you'd be scared. No, I am. I'm going to stop. I haven't even used <laughs> Take control back, paint, Andrew. If it's anything like MS Paint, I'd rather do without. I think it's, Can't it's, we fix Tux Paint on? Does that not fit? Yeah, but that, that's, uh, that is totally for kids. Uh, you must have found a reason where sometimes you just wanted to draw like a map or something or, or a note or, or, or some, something which you couldn't do in a text editor. And make quick note without using GIMP, without using F Spot. Well, no, I just install the GIMP. Yeah, and if if it, if it's not very good, that just makes it more endearing. <laughs> to be fair, the, the GIMP's much harder, and it, and it's a, then a thirty megabyte download if you're uh, in a cave in Socotra. Okay, you can have it. <laughs> you can use that, the AdobePhotoshop.com thing. There's a website version of Photoshop that you can yeah, fill well, around with. No, that's not good if you've got a you know a one kilobyte a second internet connection like we have here. You're right, and in that reason, you're absolutely right. <laughs> Good old Paint's the number one paint toggle around. Did I win? <laughs> in, a, in an ideal world, there will be no need for gnome paints. <laughs> in this in this flawed universe, yes. there is a place for it. Um, oh, <laughs> mine, mine is equally KDE good. Paint. <laughs> mine is um, Gnome Shell. Gnome Shell. <laughs> There's a theme. There's a running theme. <laughs> This this is a really cool tool that should make it into GNOME 3.0 sometime next year. And it's basically an, an augmented version of virtual desktops. Um, once it's installed and running, it replaces your window manager, um, gets rid of the lower panel if you had one, and uh, you move your mouse cursor up to the top left of the screen, and it all zooms out magically, beautifully, clutterly. Um, and you get... Your uh, launch menu on the left with the most common applications and any recently accessed files. And you can add virtual desktops, drag files onto those virtual desktops. As you drag a file onto virtual desktop, it will open the application that loads the default application for the file type. Or you can double click on it. Um, and it's beautiful. It's really nice. It's, um, doesn't use many CPU resources. It's smooth. It's still got some work and it still needs some work, but, um, it's, it's a great, great feature. Is it actually like usable it. though? I mean, I've seen it. It looks really, really. Um, uh, it does look great. It look, you know, smooth and. No, flashy. GNOME Shell guys, well done. It's awesome. It really is. But to, would you would you want to use it on a day to day basis? To be fair, it's a little bit rough. I mean, it, it, finding the right application is still a little bit difficult, and it gets rid of the applications menu because it gets rid of the top panel of GNOME. But this is why you know we've had the same kind of desktop layout for many many years. I, I you know looking at it I couldn't see myself I'm a keyboard user tabbing around maximizing windows. I couldn't see myself zooming in out in out in out all the time. Well, the thing is you just have to do do you use virtual desktops? Yeah. <clears throat> well, I I do have mine set actually to something similar where I move the mouse to a certain part of the screen and it zooms out and I choose the one that I want to switch to. So it's that functionality but with the added advantage that you can launch applications from it and get to all of your recent documents and put them on the, the workspace that you want mm-hmm. it to work on. And so it's simply it's simply an extension to virtual desktops as I see it, but I am quicker with it. It's quicker. Right. And, so it's genuinely it really nice. produ- yeah, yeah. Yeah. productive. It, it is actually. It actually works really, really well. Yeah. When we looked at it yesterday, fiddling around with it, and it, it's the way you can drag files into new tabs in G-Edit is just awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because the screen, the actual window of a G-Edit isn't just a little texture. It's the actual G-Edit screen. So you can mouse over it and use your mouse wheel and, and the window gets bigger and actually pops out of the virtual desktop so you can see what it's, what it's doing. Um, it's incredible, all thanks to Clutter from what I can tell. Yeah. And the new JavaScript GNOME bindings, which is rather random, but apparently it works. Drag, drag a, a folder full of images, for example, and Nautilus will open and display the thumbnails of those images automatically. And you can see them quite clearly from the... Uh from the GNOME shell view of things. Do you think there'll be a lot of hardcore, staunch, c- current GNOME fans who are going to say this is too much oh, yeah, of a radical yeah. overhaul and, of the desktop? what they'll do is they'll draw their little desktops in GNOME paint and <laughs> send them to you. <laughs> but it's not hard to get back to the old GNOME style, I think. I think it'd be, it'd be optional. Right. You know, the top, right, le- the top left corner, sorry, says activities. They'll, they'll make that optional, change it with the application's word, and that's it. I hope it has good key bindings. Cause, uh, it will do, yeah. It, it, it's still metastasia underneath it all. Right. Um, so you have to just jump around between desktops. Yeah, you can still use the same key bindings. They still work. Yeah. Paul, last uh, last week you had some crappy game called something like Brain... Brain something Smarty or, Party. Something or other. Do, <laughs> do you mean Brain Party for iPhone? That's the one, yeah. It's a great game, Roger Byte. What, um, what vanity projects are you pushing now? <laughs> this time I've discovered that Wikipedia is quite funny. <laughs> and let me read out this to you. This is, I, I, I promise you this is what Wikipedia says. Okay. This article is about the golfer. For the show dog, see Tiger Woods' dog. (laughs) (laughs) 
Seriously, for the show dog, see Tiger Woods dog. So Wikipedia makes me laugh. So which one was named after the other one then? <laughs> what? <laughs> was Tiger Woods named after the dog, or the other way around? No, I think the show dog may be around today still. So uh, my real discovery though is, is, is clutter, which is what backs GNOME Shell. And I wrote a tutorial for the site last week, a nice long clutter tutorial, which you should go and read because it's awesome. And um, I really like it. Um, the tutorial is written all in the C API, so it took a little bit of time to get my head around it. Um, but we are in the magazine going to be running a series of clutter Python tutorials, which should give everyone else a chance to uh, get started nice and easily. But what I really like is the fact that effects and animations are basically free. It's a higher level framework than just, you know, buttons and sliders and checkboxes and stuff. It starts thinking about where do the things go on the screen. And that's why in UNR you can you get all the animations zooming in, uh, fading, spinning, free of charge, because Clutter just says, hey, make it spin. And that's what I really like in Clutter. You don't, have to, you don't have to manage animation if you don't want to. You can just say, make this spin over a second, and then just forget about it, and it will just do, handle it spinning automatically for you. And that is very, very cool. Um, and the end, the end project in the um, tutorial I wrote, there's a load of um, colored rectangles on the screen. You click on them, and they all kind of fly off and spin with a bounce effect to any r- random place on the screen. It looks really, really nice, and it's basically almost no code at all thanks to Clutter. It's incredible. I think that's what makes GNOME Shell look so great. Uh, it's all done in Clutter. So it's got, it's got very, very low system requirements as well, um, which is what's going to make the real difference. It works on little netbooks and stuff. Um, which is, I think, why uh, Intel loves it so much. Intel bought Clutter, obviously. And uh, so, yeah, I'm, I'm very, very impressed. It seems like an ideal candidate for our kind of core graphics framework, desktop graphics framework, you know, to get all those nice OS X kind of effects that you take for granted now Absolutely. when you use OS X. Yeah, uh, I think it, it may well replace um, Compass. I know, yeah, the Compass can remain the super advanced. Yeah. Comp is, you know, with the wobbly windows and stuff, it can, the fire effects when things get minimized, it can do all those very, very easily because it's got far more advanced technology behind it. Clutter just does have a much simpler version, lightning fast, works everywhere. Yeah. And and because it works at a higher level, you just say, hey, you sort it out and Clutter does it for you. Whereas Comp is, it, it doesn't care how applications work, it just it's sort of window managing it. You know? So it's a different level of stuff. So I think I think Clutter has more functionality in there for doing cool things at the level we care about. So what's the future of Clutter? I mean, is it just going to be developed as an independent kind of API, or is it going to be integrated into Metacity or something yeah, yeah, like it's, that? Yeah, it's, it's independent. Um, right. it's, it's very, very close to GTK in terms of its, its thinking and its bindings. Um, but 1.1 is being developed, and it's backwards compatible with 1.0. So right. we're going to try and keep it stable now at 1.0's API, uh, and just add more stuff to it. And, and it is very cool, the fact that you can just say, hey, okay, let's put you into a GTK window with some buttons and stuff, and, and Clutter becomes a, a, a first-party uh, widget. It works like any other, any other widget in GTK. Yeah, yeah. Very, very cool. So I think we'll see more of it. I've not discovered anything related to software. Um, oh, I'm, Andrew. I know, I'm sorry. But That's so interesting as well. I think, what have you gone and done? I think I can make up for it, though, with news, news fresh back from Vienna, of a dish called Tyrolean liver. Ah, um, which is about it's about two thirds by volume chopped up liver, one third by volume chopped up apples, um, with a sprinkling of of spring onions on the top and a dollop of jam in the middle, <laughs> and it's served with thick gravy. Whose liver is it? <laughs> <laughs> Otzi the Ice Man. <laughs> Incidentally, if you're in Vienna, go to Café Altveen on Monday, because they do good schnitzel. Only on Mondays? Only on Mondays, yeah. It's a special. Is that, does that taste good? No, it tastes rank. It does sound like it tastes rank. It's horrible. So I, is this news more like a warning? It, it's, it's, it's not really... It's the discovery. It's the shock factor. It's the... What the heck? People are actually sitting there in the Tyrol, in their lederhosen, you know, eating this stuff. But it must depend on the liver. I mean, if you if you choose an individual oh, who's, yeah, it's, who's it's, had a healthy if it's life, really really nice liver, then the jam and the apples <laughs> just go well with it. I don't know. I mean, if it's somebody's liver like mine, you know, who's, who's far, too, far too much wine, it pickled. Yeah. Wouldn't, yeah. wouldn't yours be more like that of a foie gras goose? Really, <laughs> really succulent. Force fed, force fed for the first thirty-seven years of his life. <laughs> oh, <laughs> please keep that bit. <laughs> It's time for the open ballot, uh, which this this episode asks, is Chrome or OS uh, zero? 
or hero. Uh, let me refer to my notes. Um, in the in fact, we always get lots of responses. Um, on tuxradio.com when uh, we pa- ask our questions. So thanks very much. Uh, when I checked this morning, we'd had uh, 27 people respond to the question, um, 12 of whom had said uh, no. As <laughs> <laughs> in hero or zero? No, no, which is which I took to mean Chrome OS is zero. Uh, six people said that it was a good thing. 12 people said that it was a bad thing. Um most people who said that it was a bad thing um, say they need more than just a browser, which is what Chrome OS is. Um, there were also people were suspicious of, uh, well, not suspicious, but um, worried about Google owning even more of their data. Did anybody say anything interesting? Yeah, Jonathan did. All right. He said, ultimately, I'm not interested in Chrome OS. I just need more applications other than browsers, and I don't have faith in the cloud. I do, however, think that this is a good thing for Linux in general because hardware vendors are going to pay attention to Google and want to make sure the hardware is Linux compatible. I, I think that's a very good yeah, point. Yeah, completely agree. Um, and, and probably the best thing that will come out of Google Chrome is the fact that people, well, Google will make Chrome OS compatible hardware work, um, and we'll all benefit from that because the drivers will go back into the kernel, presumably. Um, I'll choose an S, a yes, sorry, from Crisp King. He says, um, I agree that for the average user, just a browser should be enough. Nothing additional to install and nothing hopefully to go wrong. They can just sit and get on with what they do. Me, on the the other hand, would like to do a bit more with uh, PC, laptop, netbooks. I love Linux and all the customizations, extras and programs I can tweak to my heart's content. Quite a few people said exactly the same thing. They said that for their mothers or for their grandmothers, they, um, Chrome OS would be the ideal solution. But for them, as Linux geeks, it's going to be far too limiting. Geeks and patronizing shocker. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I could see myself having a Chrome OS netbook just thrown into a bag and using, as I do, maybe a phone. Um, for when I don't need all of the whiz bang features that you do get on a, a, a laptop on a netbook. Um, I, I think it's generally a good thing. I mean, what do you guys think? I'm scared of Google now. Yeah. I think Google DNS is very scary. That's where you can, they'll, they'll know everything you do on the whole web, whether it's Google or not. Yeah, yeah. Although, as, as you've said previously, Graham, of, of, of the podcast, it has got a wonderfully rememberable IP address. <laughs> yeah. Was it 8888? 8888, yeah. So if, you, if you're somewhere and you, so for some reason, I really need a DNS server <laughs> for some reason. Which is what happens. It, it, it can, yeah. But it all goes wrong. Yeah, it all goes wrong. And then you forget you changed it. Yeah, 8888. But then, then Google will know everything you do ever. They claim it's anonymized for statistics, but they know. They know. And they launched Google Property recently as well, which I think is quite nasty. Google Property? What's that? It's, uh, oh, you were away, weren't you? Mm. Um, it's basically it's Google Maps where people, real estate agents can just type in some details and the things for sale appear directly on Google Maps. So Ooh. Browse, and, and shares in Rightmove, which is a, a web uh, property seller in the UK, dropped 10% straight away. Oh, dear. And only a few months ago, the shares in TomTom were down a quarter straight away if they announced Google GPS. So all these things, you know, backed by Google, completely free to use. They're starting to get into sectors that, that people are starting to lose money on now. And it, uh, uh, when does it stop? They're starting to stamp on random companies now, which is a bit mean. Um, so I'm scared of Google, and I don't think I'll have a Google Chrome laptop. It feels a little bit like a, a series in the 80s called V. Yeah, V was yeah. great. <laughs> and a scary little lady. <laughs> yeah, but every, everybody's, everybody's isolated IP is one of a city on Earth. And, and Google is the invading alien <laughs> army. That They wake up one morning, and there's a great big UFO sitting over there, over there over their uh, navigation software or over their property. You're saying Eric Schmidt eats mice. <laughs> well, did, didn't Eric Schmidt say a couple of days ago that the only people who need to be worried yes. about um, hiding things are the people who are doing bad things? If you're worried about what you do online, maybe you shouldn't be doing yeah. it. Yeah, <laughs> that would be the same thing. I mean, that's the beginning, isn't it? If, yeah. that, if that's not a... So if, if we're not with Google, does that mean we're against <laughs> Yeah, that's that's that. Oh, I, yeah, don't break, make me tell that story again. So, so, yeah, so either way, Google uh, OS looks a bit scary to me. It's basically give my entire computing life over to Google. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that is worrying. What do you think, Mike? I really think like. It's a good thing? I really like the look, the you know, the concept behind it. As, as I've said before, yeah, I think this is a perfect thing to give to my parents. Um, you know, it's something that can't go wrong. 
as, as you know, in ways that a normal computer operating system can. So, um, yeah, I, I could see myself having a, a, a tablet with it on, you know, a, a cheap tablet PC, uh, yeah, pull it yeah, out, browse yeah. the web, and do that. Um, so, uh, you know, it, it's clearly designed like this in the first place. Um, so, yeah, so, the, you know, the concerns from the readers um, and listeners saying, oh, it doesn't have enough apps, but that's kind of the point, isn't it? You know, if you want a, yeah, yeah. A, um, a, a mobile OS that has native apps, then you've got Android for starters and, and, course, and, and full-blown Linux distributions. And, and we'll quickly realize how all... Uh, powerful Google is. I mean, people in, the, in in some of the comments, people say they want a music player. I'm sure Google will come up with a solution for a music player, probably yeah, through their yeah. own online music store, and they'll do it in in the similar way that they've done YouTube without any without respecting the creator's rights. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, YouTube was there before Google bought it, but yeah. Um, yeah, Google. I see, but you know, the, uh, Google having an operating system is a major is a big move. It's a move I, they probably had to take. Yeah. Um, so you're you're one of the people who falls into the no, not for me personally, but probably yes for my mother and grandmother. Yeah, I, I think overall it's, it's a good idea. Um, I'll choose another no, as we've a couple of us have said there. Uh, yes, there's a no from uh, forget Irving. He says OS what OS glorified Google interface is what we're talking about. Why is it, why is it that smartphones are taking off? iPhone and Android, along with Palm, WebOS, and Symbian, people want to be able to do things that require local compute cycles and local storage. Yes, the web plays a big part in that, but usually not the only part. And if you have a device that can do more, then why restrict it? Well, that's what we've been talking about. How about you, Andrew? Does uh, it pique your cynicism, or do you think that it's going to be a good thing for Linux? Um, well, getting back to the um, the um the division between uh, the perfect possibilities and the imperfect realities. I don't think it it will work for me because um, every so often my next door neighbour discovers that I've I've cracked his password and changes the <laughs> and, uh, so I can't get on the internet. And if and if if all I had was was Chrome, yeah, and Google OS, yeah. that would be useless for me. And you'd be useless to Google. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is cached locally. It's well, it is it. It's cached locally. Data. So Your life. Data, it's cached yeah. where? stored on your machine. Google a few years ago, before any of this stuff came about, before even Chrome browser came about, invented Google Gears. Which oh, is of course, offline yeah. syncing system. So your files are local, and you can modify them all you like. When you go online, it just resyncs them online. Yeah, well, still, I don't know how that works. So if you make changes don't like online for computer. Yeah, I've 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 wondered that actually the same thing. You know, I can, you know, maybe a really can help me out with this as well. You know, you use mm. Subversion for some reason, and you check out a file, and it goes, "Oh, you've modified this. I'll just call it R19, and you've got R18." And you're like, oh, "I don't, I don't, how do I re- rearrange these and sort it out?" And you end up just deleting one of them and saying, "So you sort it out for, dash dash force, you figure it out." But in, in, in Google now with Google Gears, if you make a change locally, and then you go to another PC and change the online version, how does it sync the two together? I don't know. It's a good it, question. It doesn't. Yeah. I guess it would save a new file. R nineteen, yeah. <laughs> Who knows? Yes. No, no. I don't. I don't even think it'd be good for my for my mum or grandma or even for my dad or granddad. Well, you agree with uh, most of the comments we had, um, and I think most people. I, I think that typifies most people's response. I think it might be a very similar experience to the original um, iPhone release. Hey, everything's on the web. Make your apps just on the web. Web browser only. Yeah. And then, oh, go on then. <laughs> Have your own SDK and something you get an explosion of interest. I, th- I think Google's got something else up its sleeve to go along with the OS, whether it's free netbooks or, or whatever it is to ensure that people will uh, will want to use it. There's something comforting about having having something you can hold in your hand as well. Not like the difference, the difference between buying... Yeah, buying old scratchy vinyl and getting MP3 downloads. The MP3 doesn't actually exist. If all your applications only exist on some cloud somewhere, you don't really feel as if you've as if they're there. But how do people know that? If it, if it, if it is cached locally, they can't tell whether it's online or offline. It's just it's just there. Mm. We'll we'll just be able to sense it. <laughs> also, that's my personal wa- watermark for old and young people. Young people don't know what you're talking about. Old people feel your pain. Does that mean I'm old? Yeah, that's it. Officially. It's official. <laughs> Andrew is old. Wow. Vinyl? CDs? <laughs> what are you talking about? And with such merry reminiscing, we come to the end of our podcast. Don't forget all the notes uh, uh, are... Podcast wrap-up fail? What? <laughs> what are you forgetting? Again, after 20... This is almost the end of the year. 
Yes, but I've been busy. I've been doing stuff. At the end of the year, I'm tired now. It's over holiday. Yeah, but even then, I've still managed to come up with one more thing. On, and I want think. fingers on buzzers. First person to answer. All right, all right. What does Sousa stand for? Bzz, bzz. Andrew did get Damn. it first. Um, it's... Um, Wrong. Too slow. Software und System Entwicklung. Entwicklung, Damn. yep. Which means... Which means um, Versprung durch Technik. Nicht mit, mit dem Brat... Mit, mit dem Development von das Software ja, aus, und System. Aus Köln. Also, yeah, Software und System Entwicklung, which is Software and System Development. So how do you pronounce Sousa, Graham? Um, Sous. Sous. No, I don't. I say Sousa. Sousa. Yeah. It's really Zousa. Zousa. Zousa, then, given the, the soft S at the beginning. I, I really don't care. Yeah, great. <laughs> and, that's, <laughs> and that's the one more thing. I've, I've got one more thing for you guys as well. Oh, right, okay. Well, and mine's actual, actually topical. You see, this is useful, you see. Oh, okay, I've been to foreign land recently. Yeah. Sousa's foreign. <laughs> Um, mine's topical because it's almost Christmas time, listeners. So I, I thought I'd ask our intrepid podcasters here a a, a Christmassy kind of question. Um, a simple one, so listen in very carefully. <laughs> <laughs> he's, looking, he's looking totally jazzed up now. Okay, here's the question. Fingers on table. <laughs> Who was born by Immaculate Conception? E.T. Is wrong. Um, oh, it, I know, it's the sheep, Dolly the sheep. <laughs> it's sadly wrong. Is it the baby Jesus? It is wrong. Any more ideas? Uh, was it Richard Stallman? It is wrong. Um, the Pope? I know, it's Deckard. Deckard. <laughs> yes. No, he's a human. <laughs> <laughs> ah, the unicorn. Actually, the answer is the Virgin Mary, if you're Catholic. You see, just a, a bit of trivia for you here, <laughs> listeners. <laughs> That we, the Christian people believe that the, uh, uh, the baby Jesus was born by the virgin birth. But because he was born through the virgin, Mary, she had some sort of sin in her, and that'd be a bad thing. So about 150 years ago, the Catholic Church decided that Virgin Mary was born through immaculate conception. She, the, she's an immaculata, she's called, which means she has no sin and never had any sin. Now you know. Mary was born through Immaculate Conception. As well. And so was her son. <laughs> no, her son was a, her son was a virgin birth. We don't call it the Immaculate Conception. I've got a copy what, of the Immaculate Collection, what which about, is great. <laughs> be aware, be aware, Protestants, you don't believe this. <laughs> this, is, this is interesting. I mean, <laughs> it's, yes. it's interesting. What's the difference? Sorry, what's the difference? And we'll talk about this in two weeks' time. I'm <laughs> yeah. What's the difference between Jesus' conception? Jesus had no man involved. And, and Mary? Mary did. It was immaculate. It was immaculate because there was no sin involved. Oh, right. Okay, okay. And uh, did she know that beforehand? Did she know beforehand? Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> so she's really just got a... It's all right. Well, it, it, it's uh, only about 1854 or 5 or so it was decided. Right. It's fairly new. I bet she was relieved at yeah, that. Yeah, definitely relieved. relieved, yes. And with that, <laughs> amazing trivia. <laughs> <laughs> Come to the Real End of Our Podcast. <laughs> Don't forget, the notes are on the website. You can find out exactly what the Immaculate Conception is. And you can tune in in two weeks' time, if you're lucky, and we'll have one more before Christmas. See you then. Bye. 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 Death to the infidel. <laughs>